Hi, so let's talk about intelligence work. Most people don't really understand what it is. And, you know, fundamentally, intelligence work is simply cooperation between countries in which you have mutual interests. Typically, those mutual interests are manifested by investments and agreements and other forms of cooperation, all of which require some sort of tribunal, some sort of resolution mechanism. And of course, the United Nations has failed, for the most part, in resolution, partly because in order to get the United Nations to be involved in your dispute, both parties have to invite them in, have to invite in, the, have to consent, essentially, to jurisdiction. And so because of that massive hurdle, the typical intelligence agency cooperates with other countries and people in other countries in order to market a message that is favorable to cooperation, which of course includes investments, culture, and so on. So, you know, actually I've got a t-shirt of the New York Times. Once upon a time I, I subscribed and the New York Times, once upon a time, did a glowing profile of Adolf Hitler. And when I say glowing, I really do mean that. They talked about his, art, you know, his artistic temperament, not one negative comment in the entire article. One of the reasons for that is because in some cases, a journalist in another country, a foreign journalist in another country, or a foreign professor in another country, is in that country at the invitation of essentially other people <sighs> and can be removed at a moment's notice. You can do that in many ways. If you don't like the institutions in your country from a foreign government, you can cut off their bank accounts, you can sue them, you can simply remove all of the diplomats, which you can close down the consulate, you can order the amb ambassador to go back to the home country, that creates a lot of problems because who issues passports, who issues visas, you know, so on and so forth. You know, and so ultimately, right now in the United States, by the way, you know, the United States has issues with claims to have issues with Chinese influence. And so it's, it's forced, I believe they're called Confucius Academies, to close down. And in addition to doing that, it's putting tariffs on uh, ch Chinese investment, and so on and so forth. Before we had this dispute, the United States attempted to shut down a Qatar-based journalism organization called, or company called Al Jazeera. And Al Jazeera happened to be reporting in a way that was counter to the message that the United States wanted to promote all over the world. And so it essentially you know, started creating issues with Qatar's bank accounts, or that, sorry, that organization's bank accounts, and so on and so forth, that escalated into a situation where the country of Qatar, which hosts Al Jazeera, and which, by the way, has a fantastic museum um, on, that, that's dedicated to a lot of the journalists, you know, who work for the organization, some of whom have died reporting on the news. And... You know, it escalated to the point where, you know, along with allies of the United States, the United States was putting pressure on Qatar to the point where you had a situation of the Gulf Coast states, uh, or I believe it's called the GCC, putting a, a blockade on Qatar to try to convince them to come, you know, over to the American side and to see things based on an American viewpoint. There's all sorts of measures. And so when, when, when I talk about the Times and its glowing profile of Adolf Hitler, you have to understand that one of the reasons we have fake news is because if you do report on the truth, you will, you will be booted out of the country. If the truth is hostile to the image of that country that you're in, because you're a guest of that country, you have no right to be there. So a lot of the news that, that we've seen, whether it's in the United States or elsewhere, for the most part is not going to tell you the truth.
because the people that are in those positions of journalism, of, uh, of professorships, and all these other ways of promoting influence overseas, they're guests. And in some cases, you know, even something as innocent as the Peace Corps was once called a neo-colonial organization. In other words, a way for the Western powers or superpowers to colonize countries from within using, again, media, professors, you know, education, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, another thing you can see is, is how even in the United States, you know, the Catholic Church essentially has set up its own separate educational system. And part of that is probably to make, <laughs> to promote its, its way of, of life, but also because you've got a situation where, you know, Adolf Hitler, whom we just mentioned, was raised Catholic as a child. When he came into power, Adolf Hitler made a deal with the Catholic Church in, in exchange for neutrality, in exchange for not confiscating Catholic property, Adolf Hitler agreed to leave the, the church alone for the most part, although the Nazis did imprison uh, individual priests who were publishing independently you know, criticisms of the Nazi party. And that, of course, happened, again, not just under that government, but under, you know, in the Soviet Union, people who were critical to the Soviet Union. Even if they went to Mexico, they were still followed by intelligence agents, and in some cases, allegedly killed. So remember that overall, in order to attract investment into your country, you have to promote an image. There's always competition for money and investment. Where will that money go? And in many cases, the media is simply an arm of the banking institutions or the military or whoever is really running things in your country. And in almost every case, the truth, if you really wanted to, wanted to lay it bare, would make it somewhat difficult to compete for those same category of assets. Because if you really did have a, an honest profile of the United States, you would have to essentially say that the country is suffering from extreme segregation. A lot of the wealth that is now concentrated as a result, not of a work ethic or of a special system or of an honest legal system or of an honest police system. It's simply the result of centuries, or at least one century, of slavery from the west coast of Africa and then the inhumane treatment of those people that were shipped across the Atlantic Ocean. And you can look at a backlash that happened when the Vietnam War occurred. You can see how the government in that case, whether it was through Joseph McCarthy, a Catholic, or somebody or other people, were trying to clean up house. They were trying to kick out anybody that was critical of the, the war within the government, whether it was in the State Department or otherwise. And the State Department is essentially an open, I consider it to be an open intelligence agency. It's, you know, out there to influence. With the Peace Corps, you had a situation where we talked about controlling the information. A letter was sent from a Peace Corps volunteer during JFK's time. JFK, of course, was the one who opened the agency and funded it. And I believe it was in one of the African countries, you know, these, when we were talking about the 1960s, right? A lot of the Af African countries were brand new, um, with Nigeria, Ghana, and so on. A lot of them came into existence in 1960 and, and thereafter, like many other countries. And so one of the Peace Corps volunteers unfortunately sent out a letter back home, not realizing that the people within the country, in many cases, might have fought a civil war for their independence. In many cases, we're, we're reviewing the mail that was being sent back. And in this case, one of the Peace Corps volunteers referred to the, to the society and the culture as primitive. That was published on the front page of the newspaper or whatever the means of communication was back then. That Peace Corps volunteer was told to come back to the United States.
it was suggested that she come back to the United States. So you've got a situation where there's always been this, this idea that diversity is a good thing. But in order to facilitate investment along with diversity, there's always been that battle between trying to understand somebody by putting yourself in that person's shoes and also at the same time trying to convince a limited pool of investors to recognize that your systems and therefore your culture is superior and deserves those dollars or those those euros or so on and so forth or that or, the, or that yen et cetera et cetera and in order to do that that, that there's always been that inherent conflict and so ultimately, the idea has been that you've got, you know, the military as a last resort. If everything else fails, the military comes in. And so when you think about intelligence agencies, the, another thing you have to understand is that they're really supposed to be diplomatic agencies. Now, of course, the CIA has been involved in coups across the world. In Africa, it deposed people that were considered to be you know, excessively nationalistic. It succeeded in Africa in some places. It failed in Cuba. It succeeded in Iran with Mossadegh, and so on and so forth. But fundamentally, when we talk about intelligence, we're talking about human intelligence. And what people don't really understand is that with human intelligence, when you're trying to get information, let's say you're extremely patriotic and you think that there may be an issue with relations between Pakistan and India, and therefore Pakistan and the United States. And you want to volunteer to go to Pakistan and live there and, and help the United States gather information. Well, first of all, you know, do you speak or do? What languages do you speak? How are you going to fit in? Do you speak, any, even if you happen to study the language, if your parents or somebody in your family is not a native speaker, how are you going to get information other than trying to learn a language, you know, in a way that that helps you yourself gain information about what it really means to be a fluent speaker. Even if you happen to be semi-fluent, remember that the working class and the farming class, vital constituencies anywhere you go, because most of the world's economy is still based on agriculture. That's why the WTO negotiations are so, so, so contentious. Each country is trying to protect its agricultural sector. In the United States, Iowa, under the current system, which is flawed, essentially picks the presidential candidates. And of course, Iowa is almost completely homogenous. And, and so it has that power because of government subsidiary of subsidies, and those subsidies are related to agriculture. So even in the United States, we're not talking about just the developing world. We're talking about highly advanced economies where the political system is tilted in favor of agricultural interests. When I talk about these things, I don't want you to think about us, them, develop, developing. Everyone's in the same boat when you have a globalized economy. So with respect to you know, your own desire to help, remember that you know, even if you speak the language semi-fluently, you're still not going to understand the culture. You know, Pakistan being an example, you're still going to have to understand, you know, what it, mean, what it means to be, in most cases, a Muslim. And not just a Muslim, but remember, Islam is practiced differently depending on where you are, just like other religions are practiced differently. So, and remember, if you're semi-fluent, you're going to be semi-fluent with respect to the educated classes, the political class. That doesn't mean you're going to be able to talk to or identify well with the majority of the country, most of which would be not elite, working class. One of the reasons the Chinese changed the language in some, you know, in some respects and simplified it was because they were concerned once they had the revolution, and it was because they were really sort of trying to make the language more accessible. They were concerned, probably, I'm not an expert on Chinese history, but my point is that whenever you have a power of working class revolution, things get more simplified. And part of the reason you have a revolution is because the elites, the political class has created all these different systems that are too complex. And so if it becomes too complex, especially in the legal sector, you have a French revolution because the only reason to have 
an extremely complex legal system is to protect the elite, who will who then have access to the knowledge on how to access a supposedly neutral third party or mediator to rule on an issue. <sighs> you put all these things together and what you're really looking at is not the ability of a domestic agency to accurately gain information from another country. What you're really looking at is the ability to cooperate, spend your money in order to buy people overseas. And so the Catholic Church does, you know, has an active program where it goes in and, and claims to help people overseas through anti-poverty programs. That's, that same strategy is done by the United Nations, it's done by USAID, it's done by all these agencies that were once called neo-colonial agencies, a way for superpowers to disrupt the culture of smaller countries using financial power and therefore displace the culture. And I call that shopping mall culture, by the way. Anywhere you have, anywhere you go, really, whether it's the United States or otherwise, you're going to have a system that replicates what you see in your country because that's what people are familiar with when they go overseas. They're trying to bring their culture with them. And in the case of the United States, the easiest way to understand that neo-colonialism aspect is shopping malls which again, as of now, because of Amazon, Alibaba, and so on, Tmall have become in some cases obsolete or in some respects obsolete, but that's the system. <sighs> so once you understand how difficult it is for an intelligence agency to actually send its own people overseas, you understand why you have to buy people in other countries. You have to boost them in other countries. And the way you do that is by paying people, by opening agencies, you have a, by trying to claim to help poor people, by opening schools, the Peace Corps. When people, when countries will ask, what, what are you looking for? What do you need? In almost every case would say, teachers, farmers, those would be the, really the two things that you would need. Somebody who would, would be familiar with the classroom and somebody who would help feed or increase crop yields and so on. Of course, science as well. So engineers and so on and so forth. So you can get a sense of the idealism that occurred in the 1960s with all these different countries that became independent, while at the same time you had Vietnam happening, where you had the other side of the coin, a lack of idealism, just sort of this attempt to push out a competing superpower, China, which was of course funding, in many cases, people within uh, North Vietnam. That may have shifted. It may have at some point been the Russians, but you know, and in fact, at one point, the Chinese and the Americans cooperated to force the Russians to break a security pact because you have the Communist Republic of Vietnam, of China, and of course, the Soviet Union, but you still had competition between people on the same ideological spectrum. And so the Russians were forced to break away from their security pact with Vietnam. Vietnam, of course, is a vital country because of its ports, which allow for global trade. And so China essentially took over the paternalistic protection role. And when it did that, it came into, into conflict with the United States, which was trying to force the south of Vietnam to separate in the same way that you now see South Sudan and Sudan. You now see Eritrea and Ethiopia ports. Eritrea is a port. It's very favorable to the EU. A lot of the, a lot of times, if you don't have diplomacy, even if you manage to succeed in separating countries by economic or religious commonalities, you still fail because within, in Ethiopia's case, there is now a civil war happening because you have a part called uh, Tigray, T-I-G-R-A-Y, that it considers itself different from the Ethiopians and the Eritreans, and it's trying to claim independence. And as a result, it appears that both the Ethiopian government and the Eritrean government are blockading this new movement for independence and causing starvation. So you look at all these different things and you realize that when you're thinking about intelligence agencies, what you really want to, what you really want to think about is probably infiltrating 
institutions within your own country, corporations, you know, trying to figure out which direction they're going so that you can craft laws that make sense, that you can figure out which laws don't make sense. And it's not that difficult to infiltrate. When I say infiltrate, all you have to do is boost somebody. It's not that hard to give somebody a new identity, a new ID, or a fake no-show job that looks spectacular. And of course, the easiest way to boost somebody is to have somebody else doing all the work. In the same way that a CEO has a secretary and a whole team sending out messages for him or her, if you wanna boost somebody, again, it's, it's not that difficult if you have a team that is backing a your candidate because you're going to literally have five or 10 people in a PR team, a confidential PR team, working to boost this one candidate against normal people who again are just one person for the most part. So when you look at these things, you can see number one, that the United States has failed in legislation because you do see how technology companies have been regulated differently than in China, for example, where the government does seem to have a better control over the technological standard, which again indicates that, you know, they're doing a better job in terms of domestic intelligence, which again probably indicates that they have fairly comprehensive surveillance powers. If you look at some other countries which dispense with this sort of fig leaf that separates the military from and military R&D from civilian society like Egypt, which just outright allows its military to own you know, companies, or at least partially own companies, because you're either gonna have the military protecting your assets or a private security company protecting your assets. And even Amazon now, of course, makes drones. Drones are, of course, a military tool that were developed as a military tool something that would be cost-effective and more efficient than, say, an F-16 or something else. Um, and again, if you want to have surveillance, especially on a foreign country, a drone would be the way to do it. You've got the camera and so on and so forth. A lot of times what you saw in the past, you saw people claiming to see UFOs. Those were probably drones gathering surveillance. Um, I guess my point is when you're looking at all these different things, all these different factors, and you're looking at something like human intelligence or humans, the question is always how do you influence, how do you, you know, essentially get your marketing message out there? And in, in, in an age of social media, that's becoming extremely difficult because now you have, media has completely fragmented. And that's one of the reasons why the culture in countries that have not practiced outright censorship appears to be in conflict. And the, the way to fix these issues, quite frankly, simply, me, simply requires perhaps a more honest method of influence. If you're just gonna buy influence in foreign countries, you're gonna buy allies. That strategy is not really gonna work. Remember that Japan and Germany were rebuilt by the United States post-World War II. And they were rebuilt by putting them in debt to the United States in exchange for what was at the time a superior way of doing things, of building things. And of course, you could claim superiority post-World War II with, with respect to math and science and building because the United States was, in some respects, the last country standing. And even its own allies were in debt, like England, were in debt to the United, to the United States. So the superiority angle was, was simply assumed post-World War II. It doesn't look like the United States has realized, has realized that this globalized trading system is based on the sea, it's based on the US Navy, that's based on insurance contracts, that's based on shipping insurance, that's based on regulations that the United States designed not just in, with respect to the sea, the, the law of the sea, but also simply to tariffs, to international disputes, and so on and so forth. It doesn't appear the United States fully understands that the Chinese have built a completely different system, a land-based system that, that seeks to avoid American jurisdiction. And to the extent that that land-based system 
is more effective and more secure. It appears that the American system is going to try to either isolate itself from competition, which is what it's attempting to do right now, or try to create a system where it markets itself in a way that makes it easier for countries to accept its influence rather than another country's influence. That's where you get into propaganda, marketing, recruiting, and so on. And, and, I, and I really sort of wonder if, if, any of the, if any of it is going to be effective, because remember that to the extent that you really do have superpowers operating in isolated spheres of influence, the, the question is whether war is, is in, in, inevitable. And the idea behind putting a country in debt after, after they've lost the war is to create a mutual interest between both countries. Obviously, a country that's lost the war has to rebuild. So it has an incentive to align itself in a way that helps itself rebuild in a fair way. Hopefully in a fair way. Obviously, that was not the case post-World War I. So right now, if you're an American right now, and you're, you realize that for the first time in a long time, in a few decades, we have competition. The question is whether we're responding to that competition in a way that makes sense, in a way that's sustainable. Because we know that the Russians are distancing themselves from the US dollar. They don't really have US dollar debt. We know the Chinese or Chinese government is a net creditor of the United States, vis-a-vis -vis the United States. So the, we see a movement away from the United States dollar and therefore a movement away from the United States current legal systems, political systems, and other methods of influence. And how do you maintain overall the ability to market yourself and when you're competing with a country that appears to be unstoppable? It appears to have created the largest middle class over the last 25 years, eh, about 20 years, more than any other country, and perhaps more middle class people in human history in such a short period of time. How do you compete with a country that was formerly victimized by colonial powers in the sense that it had Hong Kong stolen from it? Under the, under the terms of an un, unfair treaty. It had Macau stolen from it under, under the terms of an unfair treaty. It, of course, has received Hong Kong back and appears to be angling to ensure that Taipei, or sorry, Chinese Taipei or Taiwan eventually returns into its own ambit. How do you create a kind of cooperation that works. And if you are the head of any intelligence agency, agency anywhere in the world, that is your task. In a world that is running towards separation of systems and trading routes, the task should be not encryption, not crypto. And, uh, it really should be trying to figure out how to bolster cultural ties in a way that makes sense. And that's the hard part because now a lot of things are moving online and so it, it, it's really easy simply to simply to argue that you're just going to you know put everything online and then make it available to people even aside from the fact that some services would be blocked of course you have a vpn but even aside from all these things there's always this idea that nothing compensates for human to human communication and that's how things get done and if you remove that, if in other words, if you reduce trade, if you start to discriminate against trading partners, if you start to malign other countries in order to market yourself as the best destination for anything, tourism, trade, semiconductors, etc., it makes the task of diplomats and intelligence agency agencies much more difficult. And the real challenge is going to be trying to figure out, in some cases, not how, how not only 
to overcome the digital divide, but also conflicts of interest within your own country, between technology companies that are inherently global and between manufacturing companies that are also inherently global because most of them trade overseas substantially or have a supply chain that is dependent on globalized trade. But the idea overall is if you're just going to have a, a global system that's based on money, based on trade without an exchange of culture, it's never actually worked before. Um, you know, there's, there's Chinese culture in Malaysia, right? How did that happen? A king decided to come by, I believe, and dated a, I believe, a, the Sultan's daughter in, I'm trying to remember, in Malacca. Then that allowed a peaceful cooperation between the Chinese Navy led by Zheng He or Cheng Hu. There's different names depending on which country you're in. And, but all of that was really facilitated by essentially a royal marriage. And that's why you have those royal marriages. That's why you had them, because the idea was that you were going to use the influence of the royal family, whether in the UK or overseas, in order to promote your culture. It wasn't just in Europe. It was all over the world. It's just different names. Raja, Sultan, instead of Queen and King, and so on and so forth. Right now, obviously, that system is failing in some sense. You have the British heir to, to the throne, the son of Princess Diana, who is now in the United States, and he has essentially abdicated his responsibilities to, the, to his home country. You have not a peaceful cooperation system, but you have essentially, in some cases, almost a hostile break which is a serious matter if you realize what the European system of marketing was based on, which was, in some cases, this idea that the royal family was going to show a side of the British that maintained, maintained a, mon a monarchy type system, at least in show which is really, again, a conduit for marketing and recruiting all over the world, which, of course, facilitates trade still with the Commonwealth all over the world and currency and so on. If you don't have the queen and the king and their heirs maintaining that cultural line, what is going to replace them? Who is going to take up that mantle of marketing that facilitates everything else? Is it... In the United States, it looks like it's going to be the banking system, the insurance system. Warren Buffett sells insurance, the hedge funds, and the athletes, the sport, the sporters, sporting events, and so on and so forth. That, of course, is another reason why countries claim to try to boycott other countries and so on and so forth. It's, again, yet another attempt to market yourself using people within that country to show a quote-unquote a superior system. Not only for investment, but to your own people, so you don't lose your own people to other countries. So you see how a lot of the old institutions are fraying, are not collapsing, but are becoming outdated. And we're in this weird middle period where we don't know exactly what's going to replace them. It's not going to be social media, but if it's not going to be social media, and we know that we live in a fragmented media system, what is going to happen? Well, the answer is a lot of consolidation in the media. The answer is going to be, at least right now, if you look at the media consolidation going on, with very few major independent media companies in existence in the West, if you look at what's going on, it really does appear that the response to social media's fragmentation has been a media consolidation to try to recapture the ability to influence not just your own voters and your own people, but people all over, all over the world. And so is that going to work? You know, it's impossible to say. Remember that the media has never been about the truth. That's what we started off with. The media has always been about marketing. And we now live in a society where I think a lot of the voters, especially the younger generation, they understand the system and they want the truth.
So how do you fix that with media consolidation? It's going to be an interesting time.